Good evening. Admiral Good evening. Uh, welcome to the August 18th. I had to stop and remember the date. August 18th, Town of Foxborough School Committee meeting. We would also like to welcome members of our Board of Health who have joined us for the meeting this evening. Um, before we kick off the meeting, I would like to call everyone's attention that we do have two members of the school committee that are participating remotely. Um, Mr. Brent Reuter and Ms. Michelle Raymond are both participating via Zoom because they are participating virtually. Any votes that we take this evening will have to be by a roll call vote. So if you'll just have the patience with us to go through the individual members if we are voting on anything. Um, in addition, we are having a slight change to our agenda, the order of our agenda for this evening's meeting um, in order to allow enough time for the public <coughs> comment, which we thank you all for being here tonight. We are moving that section of the meeting to the end of our meeting so that we can allow enough time for everyone to um, make their comments and have those be recorded as part of this meeting this evening. Okay. So thank you. Welcome. Um, first on the agenda this evening is uh, the approval of the bus bid. So Mr. Yukna. Uh, so basically, um, we had two buses approved by the CIP uh, process and funded by the town side. We had the CIP committee then approve two additional buses to be paid for out of our FY21 funding, um, which gave us the full four bus uh, complement. Uh, as you remember, um, in FY21, we did not get funded for school buses, which put us behind the eight ball of uh, older buses not being able to be replaced. Um, and we keep our, our um, asset base up as much as we possibly can because of limitations on age and mileage uh, that we can run school buses. So we also, a couple years ago at the urgence of the um, DPW, we've converted from going diesel equipment to going gas uh, buses. The Previously, it was thought that the uh, diesel equipment would last longer and would be, a, a, you know, more fuel efficient. The reality for us is we can't go more than 100,000 miles in um, 10 years on a bus anyway. So having a bus that can go 200,000 miles, really, we're paying in excess, you know, usually of about four to five thousand dollars on a bus for that diesel engine and we're not getting an advantage out of it because we're uh, eliminating the bus quicker. Uh, the secondary problem is it's much harder for mechanics uh, working on diesel than it is on gas or at least getting mechanics that can work on gas versus diesel. Um, so it made it easier for the DPW side to maintain our fleet. As you know, we have uh, 22 frontline buses and about six uh, backup buses. Uh, on top of everything else the DPW has to maintain. So uh, we went out to bid for four gas-powered um, uh, buses, 77 passenger, um, only DATCO, which was kind of unusual. Usually we have three or, or four different vendors, but only DATCO actually uh, put in their bid. Uh, their bid is the same as they had on the state bid list. Um, so we could have gone through it without even going to the, the bid process, but we assumed we might have additional competition. Um, and so uh, each bus came in at $85,950. Total trade-in, as you can see, we, we only get about $2,000 a, a vehicle. So it's not like you're, you're getting much for that. Uh, and these are diesels that we're trading in. So you're not even getting much on that side of it. Um, so our net bid is $335,800, uh, which we recommend approval by the school committee. Thank you. Any questions on the on the school bus bid? Comments? No. And if there are no questions of comments, I'd like to entertain a motion. I motion to accept the bid uh, for four seventy-seven passenger school buses for total purchase price of three hundred thirty-five thousand eight hundred dollars. Thank you. Any second? I second that bid. Thank you, Sarah. So we're going to do a roll call vote. Um, Sarah? In Aye. favor. OK, thank you, Richard. In favor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And Brent? Aye. Thank you. And I'm also in favor. So the uh, motion, the, the uh, 500 is the vote. Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. Next on the agenda, Dr. Burdos and Mr. Yukner with a Burl School update. I'll let Mr. Yukna speak to this um, because he's got a lot more of the details. I can tell you after viewing through the, the higher site today, the amount of work that still needs to be done. 
before school begins um, is still an extraordinary amount of work that needs to be done in a short amount of time. But to really get to the specifics and what that timeline looks like, I'll turn that over to Bill. Yeah, the original contract date said that they would uh, complete the project by August 15th, uh, a few days ago. That had been amended to August 18th um, based on some issues with uh, materials and equipment being supplied and, and, and um, some of being around COVID, obviously, as we all know, things have gotten delayed. Some of it, quite honestly, in the, in the school building committee's uh, opinion, and, and I chair that committee, uh, in the lack of um, control by the general contractor, CTA construction of the subs uh, and of their own time schedules. Um, at this point, obviously, they didn't hit today's substantial completion requirement, uh, which uh, means that it's going to be delayed further. We are looking at this point at um, hopefully a substantial completion by Monday at the latest. Um, they have some major things that they need to do between now and Monday. Um, they will have the building inspector on site tomorrow. Uh, the fire department has uh, done a, a major review. Um, most of the life safety stuff is, is completed. Uh, the fire department did ask for a few additional things um, in the building, which they always have that option to do when they walk the building, once they actually can see it completed, if they want an additional strobe or an additional exit uh, issue resolved. Um, but that's really what it's down to, is a few additional things on that way. Um, I do believe, but I'm not positive, that the fire department signed off today on one of the major issues, which was the kitchen um, systems. Um, if not, they will be probably signed off tomorrow uh, by the fire department. I think they've gotten those all completed. Um, electrical and plumbing inspectors have been through the building, um, a few minor issues that need to be addressed by them. And really the, the major thing I think from stopping them right now from getting a, a, a certificate of occupancy is that they don't have some of the things that are required, um, sidewalks uh, at the ends of, you know, coming out doorways, which are, are obviously need to be in place um, before a building inspector can sign off uh, on it. So those are all scheduled um, and anticipated to be completed this week, but they aren't completed yet. We have delayed, obviously, our teachers from being in the building to set up their classrooms, which is obviously not the best. Um, but as we did last year, uh, we will work with the teachers, uh, with our staff, facilities, and, and maintenance to uh, try to make it as easy as they can. And they may, you know, I would say to to parents, the, the building will not be um, as most teachers would like it to be on day one with all of their nice message boards done and everything else like that. It's not the teacher's fault. It's definitely going to be the contractor's fault in this case. Um, but that being said, I think, and I know that they will have it done you know, fairly quick, quickly when the uh, school year starts, they will be capable of supporting the students and the educational side of it. That won't be the issue. Um, we are hoping to be able to have the, the teachers in the building by Wednesday of next week, which gives them some time, and we will have our staff in on Saturday and Sundays to keep it open for them if they wish to be in uh, and try to set up their rooms uh, further. So at this point, we're disappointed uh, with the, the general contractor's uh, results. Um, I've had a lot of promises today uh, based on meeting with one of the principals of the company on site um, that they will get these things resolved uh, for, you know, as quickly as possible. But uh, again, we've, we've had a lot of words with them up to this point as well. So uh, unfortunately, as the town, we are um, not able to control their subs or their schedules. That, that is totally up to their side. We control the money that they get paid. Uh, we knew we were in trouble when they were not billing us enough on a monthly basis, which obviously meant that they weren't getting the work done. Um, they had to run at a run rate of about $2.2 million for June, July, and August to meet the thing. They've been running at about 1.4 million um, a month. And so that, you know, we knew just based on that, that there was an issue that was going on here. Again, I think they've, they understand our issue, um, but it doesn't make it any easier for our students. Uh, the worst thing, obviously, and we've made this very clear that August 31st is the date the kids are showing up. Um, and we do not want to have a, a different schedule at the borough than we have at any of the other uh, four buildings. So, um, you know, I think they're feeling the pressure. I hope they're feeling the pressure from us. Um, we do evaluate them in the end. That's our only kind of ACE card that goes to the state. Um, but even that uh, at this point may be a, a mute issue as far as they're concerned. So 
Um, so at this point, um, hopefully a, a, a certificate of occupancy at the beginning of next week, teachers in on Wednesday, um, and students able to come in on the 31st. Thank you. Any questions about the update? Just one second, please, Joe. Any questions from the committee member on, on, on the Burroughs project update? No? Joe? Yes. This is from my mom. She, was, she went to the, she was the first class that opened up when the Burroughs School opened up in the 60s. So she has a long history. Good evening. This is Joe Garrity. I'm a former student of Foxborough High School. I hope everyone's had a restful and enjoyable summer so far. Um, my qu question, will there be an open house and alumni with tours sometime in the fall? And my mom is Maureen Delaney. She was in the first grade class of first graders when the borough school opened in 1967. She became a teacher because of Miss Heavey and principal because of Mr. Weiss and Miss McKim. She is looking forward to seeing the new and improved Mabel M. Burrow Elementary School. That's great, that's amazing, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Berto, so Mr. Yu, would you like to address that question? Sure, I'll start and then um, Bill can add on. We will be having our open houses and those will take place as we typically do in the fall and those are more towards the middle to end of September. I don't have the exact dates and as far as any other tours and the official um, open house, we don't have that date at this point in time. Yeah, I would say we typically would do on, on a project like this, we would do a, uh, you know, a ribbon cutting just like we did here at Town Hall um, and allow the public in to see the building. Obviously not everybody who is interested in seeing it has kids in the building so they won't be able to you know, come during uh, that parent um, open house. But uh, we typically would do a one, you know, one night open house for people to come through and see. Uh, obviously it's a significantly different building than it was when we started. It uh, now has a full size gym. Um, it has an entire pre-K wing that is dedicated just to uh, pre-K. It has, uh, you know, additional um, special ed rooms that have been designed specifically for programs that we have going on now, um, as well as having um, updated music and, and art rooms and, you know, even, you know, the general classrooms, even though they're the same size, are, are obviously fully updated. So there's a lot to see. The town, um, you know, has obviously put a lot of money into that building and, uh, like all the buildings we've done in town, hopefully um, they see that they've put the money in well spent, so. Thank you. Yeah, that'll, be, uh, that'll be quite a treat for her, I'm sure, to see how it's changed. Mm -hmm. Yep, and then I just asked him if it was gonna be like when we had it on a Saturday in the fall for like the Boyden Library in the town hall, when those kind of things happen, and the police station. Right, I don't know if they've made a decision yet on uh, what the timing will be or what, what day of the week okay. it will be. Right, so not yet, so well, no, to, to be determined. Right. I was just, what I was just asking was um, if it was going to be like the, when we had all these new buildings open up over the years, <laughs> if it was going to be treated the same way. I, th I think that we'll have it open so any of our community members will be able to come, mm -hmm. to come see it because they're going to want to see it because it's beautiful. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Anything else on the borough project update? Thank you, Michelle or Brent. I'm sorry, Brent. Brent, you're you're, you're lighting. I can't see your hand. It's so bright. <laughs> that's the only thing that's bright about me. The uh, um, I, I, Mr. Yukon, I'm wondering if if, if uh, I just want to if, if you have to reiterate, I apologize. Um, is by definition of the things that are still left. Um, an all or nothing proposition in terms of occupancy or is partial occupancy or you know <laughs> tiered occupancy or something a, a possibility if 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 uh if heaven forbid something that uh, causes further delays um some of the items that are currently not done are a requirement so would would not uh, a co would not be issued we do have a new building inspector in town who um, really does not believe in temporary COs, which, you know, many don't, so that's fine. 
Um, so he's looking to issue a, a full CO. The one thing that, that will not be done for the beginning of school um, is the gym itself. However, that portion of the building, uh, the hardwood floors will be going down basically during the time frame that the kids start to arrive. Uh, and it's a three week process. So by probably mid-September, the gym itself will be completed. Uh, but because it's got all of the life safety uh, already built in, the sprinklers, the alarms, um, everything that's necessary, um, they can issue a CO uh, because, again, it's more of a flooring issue than it is a, uh, a building structure issue. Obviously, those, that part will be closed off for the beginning of the year, and kids will not be allowed in there until the floors and stuff are done. But that's the only area that technically can be not done and still offer a, a certificate of occupancy. Thank you. Any additional questions? Thank you. Before we move to the next agenda item, which is the first reading of the public um, face mask, of the, of the face mask of the revised face mask policy, I have two requests. Uh, one is if you do plan on participating in the open public comment section of the agenda, there is a sign up sheet on the table that I meant to ask you to put your name down and address down um, so that we can make sure that we have all the information correct for our meeting minutes. So if you do plan on participating in that section, we would ask you to add your name and address to the piece of paper that's on the table over there. Um, and then we will use that piece of paper to call you, um, recognize you to come forward and speak at the table, please. The second piece is I just want to recognize you now have, do we now need to open the Board of Health meeting? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Matthew Brennan, Director of Public Health. Um, so basically our plan here for uh, public health wise is we're going to open the meeting and then I have a small uh, update kind of to give the school committee um, uh, an update of where we are right now in terms of COVID and what state CDC and everyone recommends and I'll turn it over to the board to give their own recommendations and again I want to thank you all for having us here. Um, at the Okay, so today is the um, 18th at 7.40 or 6.47. Um, we're going to open a joint meeting between the school committee and the Board of Health under our open meeting laws. Um, two Board of Health members are present, Eric Iverdon. That's yellow. Okay. And our health and director. Health director. Matt Brown. Okay. Um, so uh, just where we are right now uh, in for, for COVID, uh, oh, we are the town of Foxborough uh, is uh, experiencing a surge of cases. Uh, early in June, uh, the town would receive zero, maybe you know, three cases in, in a two week period. The last time I checked uh, Maven, which is a state database, uh, our 14 day case count right now is around 41 cases in the last 14 days. The state defines Foxborough, um, their average daily incident rate as 7.5 cases per 100,000 residents or the percent positivity rate 1.74, um, which is climbing and has been climbing since June. So right now, the CDC and um, the state DPH think it's obviously climbing due to uh, the Delta variant. Uh, what we know about the COVID-19 Delta variant is that it is more contagious. It causes more severe illness and uh, it can cause more severe illness in the unvaccinated and the unvaccinated are at the highest risk. Uh, fully vaccinated people can also get it. They can spread it and they can spread it on to others. Uh, the CDC estimates right now that currently the Delta variant is the cause for 97.7% of the new cases in this area. But we do know vaccines are highly effective. Um, right now, uh, we're seeing two sets of different, uh, different guidance, a state guidance and a CDC guidance. State guidance right now strongly recommends that K through six or pre-K through six masks for all students and staff they strongly recommend all unvaccinated wear masks, and they recommend to allow vaccinated students to be unmasked. Um, however, uh, there is still federal law that requires masks on buses, public transportation, and as well as in the nurse's office um, in, in medical settings. The CDC 
differs, uh, has a differing opinion. Due to the uh, circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, they recommend universal indoor masking. Because schools uh, host a mixed population, uh, K through six are not eligible for vaccines, six through eight, uh, you know, it's mixed, some eligible, some are not. In high schools, it has a low percentage of, of vaccination right now. Um, the CDC believes that masking um, is, is pertinent or, or the, uh, in, um, in schools, all schools be, be masked. Uh, as of August 2nd, the Board of Health met and uh, they created an advisory. That advisory recommends that the schools do wear masks this year. And if Foxborough schools did wear masks, they wouldn't be the only ones. Uh, 39 other towns have adopted similar school advisories. Um, and therefore, I'll, I'll let the Board of Health um, speak. Right. Well, our, our governor has, uh, has um, stated that he wants to leave whether masks are uh, used uh, to the individual towns and the individual schools uh, for whatever reason. Um, but because, you know, what we're trying to do for our town is be a little bit proactive rather than reactive. You know, how, how horrible would we feel if we didn't act? So, and we feel it's in the best interest of everyone to wear masks mm -hmm. uh, wherever. Our advisory says we think you should wear masks in here as well as in any public building. I mean, I wear it when I go into the stop and shop. I wear it when I go in Patriot Place, um, you know. So yeah, it's not a big deal, uh, you know, and we've been fully vaccinated. Uh, we're just concerned. So and when the numbers start going down, things will change. It could be, di it's dynamic going, with the numbers going up, it will be just as dynamic when the numbers are going down. So we can, we can react at that point. And um, we, we hope that the schools will adopt the mask uh, requirement and uh, consider you know, us as a resource and the state as a resource and CDC as a resource uh, when figuring out what this looks like and whether we go forward with it or not. And we applaud you for wanting to, to take a look at this and, uh, and make sure that it's, it, it's protective of our students and our, and our town. Anything else, Betsy? Yeah. So, I mean, we'd, we'd open it up to the committee. Um, Thank you. Dr. Burdos? So I think what I will do is just set up a little bit our mask policy, which we currently have in place. School committee, it's one of their three functions to have <coughs> policies. And our mask policy is in place and has been since this time last year. At this point in time, we do not um, have an emergency order in Massachusetts. And as a result, it's up to local school committees to have that policy either rescinded, mm -hmm. to rescind our policy that we currently have in place or to amend that. So that's why we have the first reading of our policy because we go through two readings of each policy. So that would be this evening to look at our current policy, to look at the amendments that are proposed to it, and then the next, um, reading of that and vote would be next week at our at our next meeting so after reviewing our current policy and knowing that the governor had rescinded the state of emergency back on june 15th a lot has taken place last year we learned um, much during that year at the end of the school year we ended at a place where the department of education department of elementary and secondary education um, still required mask in schools and that we were able to get students back full in person with mask and other mitigation strategies that we had in place. They also had said for the fall at that point in time that for opening that we would be full in person five days a week. There would no longer be the option for remote learning and that we need to have students back in school. That's how we finished the school year. The physical distancing requirements based on the Department of um, elementary and secondary education, I'll call them DESI, just as we go forward here, 
was that also all of those requirements would be lifted and that for the beginning of the year they would depart uh, they would collaborate with the Department of Public Health Massachusetts and they would issue any additional health and safety requirements over the summer for example mass for elementary students so they have come out and they have issued their guidance which is as uh, Matt Brennan rec um, he summarized but I think it's important also to know what's taken place over the summer where we ended and with the, the vaccination rates um, increasing, looking at our numbers, and then what has happened with those, over, those numbers over the summer and then with this Delta variant becoming more prominent and that being the majority of the cases that we're seeing here. On July the 19th, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out and they recommended that universal masking take place in schools and that not just be for those um, that were not able to be vaccinated for everyone regardless of vaccination status. So that was the American Academy of Pediatrics. That on July 27th, the CDC then came out and they then recommended regardless of vaccination status <coughs> that universal masking take place indoors <coughs> and that's for all teachers, staff, students and visitors regardless again of vaccination status. Then on July 30th, that's when the DESE and uh, DPH came out strongly recommending for kindergarten through grade six that they wear masks because they were not eligible for the vaccine and that in grades seven through 12 that they again, if um, they strongly recommended for those students if they were not vaccinated but no mask outdoors. When we look at DESE and DPH's recommendation in combination looking at those of how they differ from CDC and from the American Pediatrics Association, we then look to our local Board of Health. And we have worked in a strong partnership with our public health officials. We've got Deputy um, Chief Tom Kinvin here, as well as the public health nurse for Foxborough. We were very fortunate with all of the um, work that we did, and it was by many. It was all the mitigation strategies that we had in place last year to be able to keep students in school. That's our goal, is to have students in person. We know how detrimental it was for them not to be in school. So that is our goal. Safety is always going to be our first priority, and educating our children in person is our goal. So with that said, with the Board of uh, Health recommending to follow the CDC guidance and having students mask in school, indoors, regardless of vaccination status. That's important information for us when we look at American Pediatrics Association, when we look at Academy, when we look at CDC. We've continued to follow CDC's guidance along the way. It's consistent with what we've been doing and then with our own local uh, Board of Health. So based on not wanting to disrupt the education of our children's education in school, this is another layered mitigation strategy that we can have. In addition to all of the cleaning protocols that we put in place when we think about the electrostatic machines spraying in between every single day, all of the hand sanitizer, the wipes, washing your hands, we know how important that is. We know how important it is to stay home when you're not feeling well. The difference this year, which because we've learned so much by having this layered mitigation approach, is that to be able to have students in school, if we have these different protections and we're going to better be able to keep them in school. So for example, the protocols and scenarios, if there are COVID cases, we did not see transmission in schools last year. We followed that. If we have this additional protection with masks and you have a COVID case, then by having the mask, that's going to be able to have students exempt from testing to be able to stay in school. If they don't have mask on without that layer, then it's a matter of more students that are going to be out and testing and quarantining. We want students to be in school and we see this as an opportunity to be able to not disrupt their education. At the same time, by having students that are masked in school, we're able to then look more accurately or what are our vaccination rates. We know currently based on um, 
the mass.gov where they are looking through MAVA, as you had mentioned before, and our vaccination rates. For students that are 12 to 15 years old in Foxborough, we have a 49% fully vaccinated rate. For students that are 16 to 19 year old, fully vaccinated, we have a 70% rate. It's important to keep in mind that particularly age 16 to 19, when we think about 18 and 19 year olds, those are a lot of our students that have graduated. Many colleges and universities, if not the majority to all, they're requiring students become vaccinated. So when we look at that number and we see 16 to 19 year olds, 70% are vaccinated, many of those students have left us. We need to know exactly what our vaccination rates are with our students and then at the same time with our faculty and staff. We feel really confident that we have a high vaccination rate with our faculty and staff, but we don't have that number because school hasn't yet started. And we need to be able to know with students what's accurate with each of the grade levels. Students at the Ahern Middle School, it's fifth through eighth grade. You only have half of the students that are eligible to even have the vaccine. And out of that, based on our rates right now, it's only at 49%. So a quarter of your school is vaccinated. We know that vaccines work. We know that if we have a higher percent of vaccination, we're going to be better protected with that being another um, important strategy as far as perfect, protecting students. Being fully in person also does not allow for six foot of social distancing. We know social distancing has um, been lifted as far as the requirements. But to be in person and to be now closer at three feet, having a mask on is that extra protection for students, which is so important. The um, contagious Delta variant, seeing that increase, it is impacting students. It's impacting children, and we know that. We've, we've seen that. So if we're able to not disrupt education, and we're going to be able to look differently in our schools. We're having to, uh, last year we had desk in cafeterias, we had cohorts of students. They had to be in rows facing forward. We're now going to be able to get back to and business as usual, if you will, by having students working together in small group instruction, having them not sitting in desk facing forward to be able to have our workshop model and our pedagogy when we think about teaching and learning. No mask outdoors, but if we can have this layered approach to protect our students, but get back to teaching and learning as what we are used to in a school building. And the difference is wearing a mask and that's gonna keep from disrupting education. Then we see that as well as the science behind that the, um, the vaccination rates and the mask and the hand washing and the staying home when you're sick, that's a way to have students that are in school and not disrupt. So the mass policy that we have this evening, it does um, have amendments to it to where masking would not be outside. So during sports, during anything outside, no masking. Inside, in classrooms, in the school facility, the building itself, it would be to wear mask. At the same time, giving time to be able to look towards what are our actual vaccination rates, start the school year, see where we are, and see what happens with this Delta variant. That's a long answer to front load your policy for your first read this evening. Thank you. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do, actually I'm gonna take this down for this part, is do a first reading of the public mask policy. Um, for the sake of clarity, what I'm going to do the reading of the policy. Um, I'm any of, the, any of the sections that are now being omitted, I'm going to skip over. Um, you have a copy of that. Uh, everyone should have a copy of that policy. There's one additional, um, line that is being um, struck this evening based on the outside policy that we, we didn't um, strike before the policy was distributed. And I will make note of that when we get to that point. Mr. Brent, do you have a question, comment? Um, questions and follow-ups for the Board of Health, should that wait until after the reading of the policy? Just wanna make sure that we're keeping in order. Uh, I think because there will be discussion after we read the policy, it probably makes more sense just to lump it all together. It's fine, just, just, just tracking. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, to begin the reading, um, so this is file EBC FA for face masks. 
The Foxborough Public Schools is committed to providing a safe environment in schools during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Maintaining a safe environment is critical to the district's ability to educate students in a full-time in-person classroom experience. According to public health experts, one of the best ways to stop the spread of coronavirus and to keep members of our school community safe is the use of face masks. Therefore, using the guidance and recommendations from the Center for Disease Control, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and the Foxborough Board of Health, the district has established the following requirements which remain in place until further notice. A face covering that covers the nose and mouth must be worn by all individuals in school buildings and on school transportation. The next sentence is being struck because, of the, because it, it um, concerns being outside. Face coverings must also be worn outside when social distancing cannot be observed. We no longer have that requirement, so that sentence is being struck from the policy. Masks can be disposable or reusable, and we need, will need to fully cover the nose and mouth and secure under the chin fit snugly but comfortably against the side of the face and be secured with ties or ear loops. Based on guidance from health authorities, neck gaiters, open chin triangle bandanas, and face coverings containing valves, mesh materials, or holes of any kind will not be considered appropriate mask. Individuals may be excused as further defined herein from the requirement for the following list of reasons per CDC guidance if the individual has trouble breathing, is unconscious, is incapacitated, or cannot remove the mask or face covering without assistance. In addition, mask or face coverings will not be required for anyone who has a medical, behavioral, or other challenge making it unsafe to wear a face mask or face covering. A written note from a treating physician is required for a requested exemption. Parents may not excuse their child from the face mask requirement by signing a waiver. Additionally, face masks or face coverings will not be required when appropriate social distancing is enforced. During mask breaks, while eating or drinking, during physical education classes, while outside. Exceptions to this policy under certain, certain circumstances, such as for students with medical, behavioral, or other challenges who are unable to wear a mask, must be approved by the building principal in consultation with the school nurse or Foxborough Board of Health. Face shields or physical barriers may provide an alternative in some instances. A student's mask or face covering is to be provided by the student's family. Staff members are responsible for, private, for, for providing their own face coverings. However, the district will supply disposable face covering for individuals who arrive at a building or board school transportation without one. If students are in violation of this policy, Building administration will consult with the parent or guardians to determine whether an exception is appropriate. If not, the student may be removed from the school, building in per school building's in-person learning until such time as they can comply with the requirement or the requirement is lifted. Violations of this policy by staff shall be handled in the same manner as other violations of school committee policy. Visitors in violation of this policy will be, not, will be denied entry to the school district facility. This policy will remain in place until rescinded or modified by the school committee or is revised at the superintendent's discretion in, in accordance with guidance issued by the state or local health authorities as necessary. The legal reference is Commonwealth of Massachusetts COVID-19 Order Number 31. Other references are Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Considerations for Wearing Masks, Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, Reopening Guidelines, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Mask Up, MA, Guidance Statements from Mass Massachusetts Department of Health, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Guidance for COVID-19 Prevention in K-12 Schools, updated August 5th, 2021, um, Center for Disease Control's Guidance for COVID-19 Prevention on Public Transportation, Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, Fall 2021 COVID-19 Guidance. The source is MASC August 2020. The policy was originally adopted on September 2nd, 2020, and um, it was adopted as revised on June 15th, 2021. Okay. Now, we can open that up for questions, comments, 
thoughts on the policy or questions for either Dr. Burtis, Dr. Mello, Mr. Yukna, or the Board of Health. Brent, did you have a question for the Board of Health? Uh, yeah, actually, I, it, I was, um, because the Board of Health uh, gave a very succinct and clear presentation, I was wondering if you could, um, any of you could uh, uh, unpack a, a part of part of your uh, your earlier presentation. In particular, um, what is different about that? Um, what is it? Ninety-seven point seven of cases with the Delta variant relative to what folks in town and other towns in the Commonwealth got used to through June and early July. Uh, what I can say about that is in in uh, May, uh, if you look at the day, if you look at the CDC data on, they actually sequence the genome of the COVID nineteen variant. Um, if you look back in early May, yeah, you know, it was the alpha variant. It was other variants. Since May, it is a, that Delta variant has exploded. It went from. 17 to 30 to 60 now it's 87 97 percent um, of the new cases is a delta variant so between you know from between may early may and now in august it's gone from relatively nothing um to to every single case uh within new england really is now uh you know the delta variant you know and also what we've learned is the the original vaccine was very um, effective at blocking or at, at, at treating COVID. However, now we're finding that even with a vaccine, people fully vaccinated can carry the Delta variant uh, um, and pass it on to people who are unvaccinated or other people who are vaccinated. So. So we're, we, we thought we were moving beyond masks. Now I think we're moving back to masks because of the Delta variant until that you know, is eradicated or until we get our vaccines up or until we figure out something else. And, and as you probably heard today, we're uh, moving towards the third uh, vaccine uh, booster for everyone. We haven't figured that out yet, but uh, you know that's because how how virulent this new strain is, and we're trying to get beyond it so that we're back to masks and we're back to trying to figure it all out and try to be safe about it. Does that make sense? It does. Related, related to that, um, mostly just to connect the dots for folks listening, um, if, you, if you would speak a little bit to what those Delta variant transmission rates mean for uh, mean for unvaccinated kids and their impact not necessarily well on their own health and the health of the broader community uh, Tom do you want this one or yeah uh, good evening everyone uh, hey Brian. meaning like because if there, there yeah there may be an like if, if somebody's gonna if if, if an, arg an argument is made to say hey uh, well, you know, if kids aren't at high risk, and I'm saying if, if kids aren't at high risk for uh, contracting serious disease with the Delta variant, um, why should they wear masks? And and I've, as a board of health, I'm asking you to just kind of comment on that, on the broader impact of, for public health in the town for kids and people who aren't kids. Um, so basically, um, just to follow on what Eric and Matt were just saying, so the the original first run vaccines that we see from mRNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer were targeting the beta variant. Um, now we've evolved to the data variant. So each time that virus transposes from person to person and has a chance to mutate. With that mutation, now we're seeing a Delta variant that's probably six to six to six and a half times more infectious than influenza. So that really puts um, the, the communicability, the exposure risk, um, much higher. So you're, you're seeing that. The transmissibility is happening. So we we're also seeing um, with some of our case investigations with our new positives. Um, just at five o'clock today to update some information that um, uh, Director Brennan put out, 
Um, the positivity now is 2.97%. So we've jumped up considerably in the last month. Um, we start looking at five new cases per 100,000. That brings us back to the color map, and the color map starts to change colors at that point. We haven't been using that. But Norfolk County has been deemed um, a substantial risk for transmission. Um, with that, we know that COVID, um, it, it strikes a lot of different body systems, causes inflammation, coagulopathies, um, the way your blood can clot, inflammation to the lungs, to the brain, to the heart. Um, people now will, will clear them in the, in, the, in the community, will say, okay, you've had COVID, now 10 days have gone by, but you may not seem to feel that great. And we're seeing that there are cases of myocarditis and carditis in student athletes, where you have structural heart changes secondary to inflammation. We're seeing a lot of this, and you're seeing that particularly in the South right now. Mississippi, Arkansas, and Texas are dealing with this um, en masse. They have, they're shipping patients out. So based on that recommendation uh, from the CDC and the Mass Department of Public Health, I think a lot of this has to do with, you know, we're all so tired of it. We really are. I get it. Um, and we needed a break from the masks. So I think that's why, you know, you're having um, the governor come out and say, you know, we're going to leave that to local jurisdictions to make that decision because the strain is real. We all feel it. Um, however, um, there's no denying the data that masks do cut down on the rate of infection. For example, last year, I think we had one case of influenza in the, in, in the town, which is significant, staggering. It's, it was unprecedented. Um, however, you know, given the fact that this is a very polarizing issue, I think you just have to rely on the data and the recommendations from public health officials. Thank you. Any other questions? Come, Brent, another, another question? or I, I, had, I quick follow up and then I'll leave it. Uh, um, is if, if you would, uh, in terms of uh, Norfolk County or surrounding counties, however you want to break it down, um, who's who's getting the Delta variant? Like, uh, you know, is, is it is it hitting sectors of the population harder than others? Just curious. I think the Delta variant right now is pretty much it, it's 97 percent the predominant strain. So it is the all encompassing strain. So it's empirically across the state. Um, right now in the Commonwealth, we have 700 patients who are hospitalized with COVID. We have 166 that are in ICUs. Um, and where you're seeing that really is concentrated around the metro, metro areas, Springfield, Boston. Um, Middlesex County right now has the highest counts right now. I think we're looking at they're, they're considered high risk for transmission um, with all the surrounding counties um, be considered as substantial. But Delta variant is pretty much it right now. And it's, it really is a different animal than the, the earlier iterations of, Alta, of the alpha and beta variants. Is it hitting? Is it is it hitting uh, kids and adults and uh, rates that are different different than what you're so used to? It, if you do yeah. look at the hospitalization data, we you are seeing hospitalizations of uh, un, more of the unvaccinated population. So you're seeing hospitalizations uh, with children in their or um, you know uh, more towards uh, people in their twenties um, to to thirties rather than. Um, the 70 year old population, which is more likely to have the vaccine. So that's kind of what the data is showing right now. I think it's, uh, it, it's uh, pretty substantially uh, weighted towards the non vaccinated people nowadays, uh, as far as hospitalizations go. So it's, uh, sure. you know. Uh, and, that, and, and what I, I'm hearing is that it includes children. Includes higher. I it think doesn't. we had. Uh, we're looking at some numbers. We had a five-year-old in our town. We had an eight-year-old in our town. I think we had an 81-year-old in our town. I don't know, but you know, and we had yeah. everything in the middle and in between. Up uh, and how many we got, Matt? We're like four. We're at, right now, we're at 49 active cases being followed. 49 active cases from five till 80. So, who was that? Who does that leave out? Nobody. Mm -hmm. And I think that okay. most of the most of the people are unvaccinated, and I, I don't know—is it 100 percent of the people? I don't know, but it's pretty close. Okay. The reason I ask—I I mean, if you, it's not obvious—the reason I ask is just because we are talking about, you know, when we're looking at school policy, we are talking about a group of younger kids who cannot be vaccinated, um, who may or may not live with older folks who may or may not be vaccinated, and so that's why I'm just trying to uh, parse that out a little bit. So, so thank you for the I, I don't have the exact numbers on me right okay. now, but okay. there are children being hospitalized. And it, it, if you go to the state's dashboard, if you go to the Mass COVID, uh, Mass DPH and the COVID dashboard, it gives you those numbers for statewide um, broken out by age. Um, so we can certainly get that data to you for your next meeting. 
I just before we open up to questions, I just I'm noticing if you're following me along on television, um, that the the policy that's listed policy the policy is actually E B is in boy, um, C F A not E D. So if you're if you're looking for the policy, the code is E B as in boy C F A. So just a correction there. Michelle, did you have a, a question or a comment? Yeah, I, I've got a kind of a little bit of both, um, but it's also for the health. Um, department. I mean, we're talking a lot. I think most people understand the risks involved in what's going on with the Delta variant and COVID-19 and all of that. Um, we wish we were in a different spot right now. But one of the things whenever I'm trying to make decisions or I'm advising people on how to make decisions, I always want to look at what the cost benefit analysis is. So we're talking about masks. And there's many different kind of areas. Um, we've got the unvaccinated younger children who don't have the option to be vaccinated. And then we've got, you know, high school and part of middle school that can be vaccinated. Um, we're not sure what the percentage is for that, but it's most likely more than 50% of the kids um, in the high school are vaccinated but we need to, to, to know more information. One of the questions that I have, and it's something that I've heard a lot about is, what's the increase in concerns <laughs> regarding kids that, um, you know, suicide ideation, um, depression, all of these other things from the feeling of being isolated. We have kids that have been looking forward to, have been spending the entire summer um, non-masked, they're looking forward to going back to school and having that connection. And I'd like to know if there's any statistics that the health department has in regards to students um, in that age range. What are we looking at in increased um, ER visits um, because of suicide attempts or suicide ideation? I mean, I've heard between 30 and 50% increases from pediatricians um, of incidents you know, along these lines. And I think it's something we have to look at because I don't think masks um, are no big deal. It is a big deal to um, teenagers, um, especially because it is a barrier between them and their teachers and their peers. Um, and it's just another form of isolation. That's how they view it. So just wanted to know if there were any statistics on that. So I personally don't have any statistics. I do know, obviously, isolation is an issue for kids in uh, high school in that grade and, and depression, and, and we want to steer away from that. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't have any exact figures. I can see if I can come back uh, to you with something. But I, I think we agree with the school department that it's important to be in person rather than being, being uh, online learning like we did last year and, and you know, for all the lack of interaction and, and, and all the, the depression and whatever that would cause. So I think we're trying to do everything we can to get back to normal. And if this is a little bit that we can get back to normal, get back to in-person learning, I think that's important to wear a mask, do whatever we can. You know. And again, it should be dynamic, and we've got to figure it out as the as the cases go up or the cases go down, as the vaccinations go up. But we want to see if we can move forward to eradicating this and and having in-person learning, especially. I think, right? Whatever we need to do. I I can only second that, um, only because we are talking about bringing the students back in at least full per in person, um, full time and masks will allow us to do that um, and at closer distances. And although we don't have the statistics now and we can work on that, um, you know, if we are able to bring the students back in full time, you know, and we can have them wearing masks, that also means that there's less transmission. And with less transmission, there's a less likelihood that they will be transmitting COVID from person to person. That means that there's a less likelihood that if they do become a close contact with another student, um, then they're staying back home 
for seven more days um, and then being isolated again. Um, so at least we're trying, but we can work on those statistics. I, I think just statistically, it would be interesting. I understand your the logic, Michelle, um, based on my contact at the American Academy of Pediatrics. The correlation that you're talking about is not necessarily tied to mask wearing, but more to the isolation of not being in, of not being able to be with their peers in groups. Exactly. So that's why the that's why the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation, based on again just my contacts there, is that in person in person in groups is more is is increasing the connection, um, and if mask is the piece that allows that to happen, then that's why they're saying that they're recommending masks, or one of the reasons that they're recommending masks. So I've got a follow up. Um, what does the mask wearing and this um, policy change mean um, about our chorus and our band um, programs? Um, what happens with that? So I, I can tell you Desi uh, is working on those policies right now and we are expecting them soon. Um, but th they are expected to give us guidance on those uh, sort of activities. I think uh, MASC came out with some guidance today. I don't, I, I, did. Did. I did not bring my laptop with me and I didn't print it out so I apologize. But they did come out with some guidance today. Um, Richard, do you have that available? I can pull it up, but yeah, they did come out with it okay. with the, today. I think that I think the basic of the guidance is that um, outside everything is fine, um, and again, this is just my memory of after having read the policy. Outside everything is fine. Indoors everything is allowed, but they are um, you do if you're going to be for choral, they are recommending masks, um, and for I guess brass instruments, they were recommending some type of cover. Um, if I again, I'm just going off memory, so I apologize if I'm if I'm recalling the details incorrectly. But I think that's the current recommendation. I, I can I can reiterate, but again, just came out today from uh, MASC. This is also based upon the uh, aerosol studies that have been going on now for a year. Um, outdoors, no mitigation is needed for outdoor performances, depending on the level of the local and state transmission rates. Uh, masking with appropriate material remains the best way of reducing potential infected aerosol from circulating. Masks are recommended to be worn while singing and speaking. Bell covers can be used uh, on bell covered instruments. Depending on your comfort level, instrumentalists can wear masks only when speaking, and slitted performance masks are optional. And then there's a couple other talks about ventilation, uh, distancing, maybe decreased to three feet, continuing good hygiene. Uh, plastic face shields only stop large droplets, not aerosol. Room dividers inhibit the function of the HVA systems and are not recommended. So it's you know it's it was allowing some some space right. some space for music. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind, um, so one of the things that in in the mask um, policy, we have a provision in there that says ma you know masks are not required during mask breaks, mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm really curious to see what. Um, you know, how that's defined and how is that encouraged? Um, is that going to be encouraged for teachers to give students mask breaks, especially in high school? Um, you know, when the, I always want to note, a note and I, I always find it very interesting, is that whenever we're speaking and we're trying to make sure that things are recorded accurately, we take our masks off. Um, but then students, when they're in class, if they're having to give a presentation or do anything like that, they have to have their mask on. Um, and is that something that is going to be considered, encouraged, um, that at times they may be ha able to take their mask off for certain activities and so forth to make sure that they're clearly heard, um, as well as teachers? I'm just curious. So I'll answer that. And, and yes, mask breaks are encouraged. Teachers are also, with the weather that we have to begin the year, they're going to want to take their students outside for outdoor learning experiences whenever they can because masks are not needed outdoors. We, we know that part. Um, during snack breaks, 
taking masks off. You can walk in classrooms. You can see during snack breaks, masks are off. At all levels, mask breaks are encouraged. Taking students out when they can. I know with our wellness classes, um, they're encouraged to begin all of their wellness classes outdoors. Because if we have good weather, it's another opportunity just to be outside and again, no mask. So yes, mask breaks are encouraged. Students can ask for mask breaks at the same time and teachers will, they take their students outdoors so they can have them even outside of the classroom. Mass breaks can take place during the, inside the classroom and then they can take them outside for them as well. Questions. Um, Brent, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I'm going to. I know that you had a previous commitment um, or, that you need to excuse yourself for. Do you have any questions or comments on the policy or any other questions for anybody in attendance this evening? Um, no, thank you for indulging on my questions before. I, if, um, <clears throat> if, I, oh, actually, yes, sorry. I, unstoppable with this question stuff, sorry. Is, um, will we have the benefit of folks from uh, Board of Health coming to our 824 meeting next week? We, we haven't discussed it yet, but. Yeah, we'll discuss it and be glad to. If we can, we'll be glad okay. to. Okay, yeah, I, it's, if, discuss it if you will. I, 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 what I'm thinking, <laughs> at least if for my part, and um, I'm um, thinking that perhaps others watching might feel the same way is um, having a, yet again another update because the the ground is shifting rapidly, and uh, even some uh, some more you know a, a, as questions have come up tonight, if there's more specifics that can be brought to bear, uh, just by way of you know public information of of, of keeping uh, school board policy. Uh, in line with uh, the, the, the most up-to-date knowledge of, of, of your particular board. I, I would appreciate that greatly. That's it. Okay. Thank you. The 25th? Thank you. Is it, is next, it, is it next Wednesday? No, that's Tuesday. Next, next Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday 630. 24th is a Tuesday? Yes. Okay. okay. So. Thank you, Brent. If you, need to, if you need to drop off, thank you for joining us this evening. If you're going to stay with us, that's awesome as well. So thank you. Um, any questions on the wording of the, of the revised wording of the policy? We've talked a lot about the, gen, the, you know, the higher level stuff. Are there any questions or comments or requested revisions to the wording of the policy as it's presented? Do you have any revisions? No. Oh, sorry, no. Hi, Michelle, thank you. <laughs> sorry. If somebody else wants to go first, that's fine. No, I please totally go understand. ahead. Um, and I know we've asked this in the past, but I think it's especially pertinent right now because, I mean, based on kind of the input that we've gotten um, or that I've gotten from the general public about the mask policy, if we're going to require masks kindergarten through 12th grade, what's going to have to change to remove that? Um, because, you know, I very much, and many times I believe in, you know, being safer than sorry, but what, you know, if we all of a sudden have, you know, incidents goes down and it's easy to just continue the policy that you're in because it's easy to, to go back and say, well, it's the masks that are helping with that. My concern is that this is just going to keep going on and on. Um, and we've got back, you know, we're trying to encourage uh, teenagers and adults in the community to get vaccinated. Now we're going to encourage them to get a third shot. Um, what's, what's the end game there? What, is there a certain level that we're going to say, okay, we as a school committee um, feel comfortable with rescinding a mask policy? Um, at least for older um, students, um, or having some benchmark in place for us to look forward to if we're putting something in place like this for this coming year? It's a wonderful question. That's Michelle. a great question. Yeah. Would you, um, I know we, would you like to respond to that? So I, I think one thing is what, is, what is that percentage? And we would look to, you know, the, the experts in the field, are we looking at, an 80% vaccination rate to where we would then rescind it if you had an 80% vaccination rate, say, at the high school, or if it were 90% vaccination rate. 
and may not have that answer this evening, but what would that figure be? And then at the same time, back to Michelle to have a, a statement within the policy that's saying that the policy itself would be reviewed, whether it's periodically, whether it's monthly, to have that stated right within the policy so that it's um, reviewed with you know, further changes to be made based on that. I, I would say that we're going to be looking at this data all of the time yes. and looking to see what's changing and being able, we, we learned last year, we had to be fluid. Mm -hmm. We had to change and pivot constantly based on new information that's coming. I don't see this as anything different. What, find out exactly what our vaccination rate is, then what does it need to be based on recommendations and then hopefully we have more people become vaccinated that that is motivation factor there and if we can get to that then to say if it's i'm, I'm making this part up if it's 80 percent then that we're going to look at that to rescind the policy at that level say if it were the high school versus others the hard part is the middle school you only have two two grades that are eligible for the vaccine but to have a statement within the mm -hmm. policy you could add that in as far as to be reviewed in order um, right. Thank I, I, I'm going to say I, I'm going to say it's probably a two part. It's the vaccines and the case numbers. So if the case numbers, and I don't know, is this the state? Is this in Foxborough? Is this in the schools? If the, if the numbers are going down of of infection rates, uh, we may and and the vaccines are up. I don't know even know if it's related to the vaccines. I'm hoping the vaccines are going to be effective, but. It, it's the numbers. If the numbers are going down and we're comfortable taking off our masks that we're not going to be infecting other people, vaccinated or unvaccinated, that's, I think, what's going to drive it. Right. But again, be fluid. That's what we have to be fluid. It's, okay. di it's a dynamic situation. We don't know what it is. We'd love to say, okay, it's going to be March. We're done. Right. But we certainly wouldn't know that. We right. hope. So, you know, I, I, we're, right. I think what I'm hearing from you, Michelle, is to put some sort of provision in here to revisit right. the policy. That's a great, yes. that's a great point. Because if, right. if we put a metric in now that says it's X percentage of vaccination, new variants, new public health trends may impact that, so that may not be the right metric. Um, but we should put something in this policy that says, when we reach this metric, we will revisit and see what the appropriate thing to do is based on all of the information and all of the data that we have at that time. Is that what you're asking for? Yes, I think that, that that's a good that's a good way of kind of handling it. And also, rather than saying we're going to rescind the policy is saying we're going to move from a mandated to a recommended. Um, and I would almost say it should be reviewed on a, a monthly basis because this is something that um, is going to keep coming up. Um, we need to be fluid. We need to have it so that we need to figure out a way to make this fluid so that it's not just here's what's going to happen and until we change it, then it's going to stay that same. Because I think when you look at parents in this community, there, there's a large part of them, at least the ones that are being vocal, that don't want a mandated policy. They want a recommended, they want something that gives parents choice. Um, and we need to listen to that um, because there's so much that is being mandated these days where there's little choice and having being able to explain to our students that this is what we're looking towards because what we've been saying to them for the past year and a half is once the vaccines comes out this is all going to get better and we've changed that I think and hope is very important kids understand rules when there's a basis and they can see some ability to move beyond it. And I think that that is something that's very important 
for not only the students, but also for parents as well. I think that it is important. I appreciate what you're saying there, Michelle. I think it's important, though, that we do realize that we are responsible not only for 1,900 students, but also 500 educators and staff. Um, so when we consider all of the people that are affected by this policy, it is not just the students. It is the entire school community, and by extension, it is the entire Foxborough community. And I, I really, I, I, you know, um, I understand that there are some people that feel very strongly on both sides of the argument, and I think that that's, you know, and, and we have people, and we're welcoming people to express that. But again, I want to remind everybody that we have a responsibility for the entire school community, not just specific pockets of that community. Understood, and I agree with you. So back to the first thing, which was, do we need to put a provision in here to revisit and either rescind and to potentially revise the policy instead of rescind or pull back on the mandate? I think the word revise works in that case, right? Um, so do we need to put a provision in to revise this policy when we reach a certain metric or on a certain time frame or milestone. If it's monthly, we revisit and we'll consider what's happening then. If it is a metric that we're looking for, what is that metric that we want to put in? I second that. I think that's a great point. And I think the time frame, like Michelle suggested, is a really smart thing to re revisit it monthly because a lot can happen in the span of a short amount of time, as we know when things are changing with vaccines, with variants, things like that, they can change on a dime. I think we should, I think we owe it to everybody to, to revisit that a little more frequently um, to see where we're at, at least so that we can get a temperature check as we go along. Right. So does that, if we put in a time frame for revisiting without putting a specific metric in place, does that satisfy a concern? Is that enough? Is that not enough? Is it, does it accomplish what we're trying to accomplish? Uh, so I, I would comment that we don't need a time frame. We can revisit this policy anytime one of the five of us decides to revisit a policy. Policies are policies under the control of the school committee. We can revisit it tomorrow. We can revisit it the next meeting. So I'm very comfortable in, in my seat that we can re revise and revisit this policy at any time, at any time. I would suggest that we make it a, pro a, a procedure for us as a school committee to have a monthly report. Uh, a link, linked report with the Board of Health, maybe, that we report out to ourselves and inform ourselves of what, where we are at that moment monthly. Um, I would also reiterate that I think we did a lot of that last year. We had a superintendent's report on every single school committee last year. And I would venture that if we looked at our minutes of our school committee and the report of the superintendent, she visited health metrics and kept us update where we are with the Department of Ed and everything. So um, I'm confident that, that um, we can individually monitor ourselves and, and stay with this policy. We know there's concerns from the public, the people that are here, what we hear as well. We can stay on our game and pay attention to this. And I think we can certainly ask the superintendent and the Board of Health to continue to communicate, which I think they did weekly anyways, and communicate back to us. Um, so you know, if, if, if we set our mark, Monthly, we want to talk specifically about metrics and masks and where we're going. Um, I would not want to personally, I would not be an advocate to put numbers in there or hard metrics at all um, because of the fluidity of, 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 the, of it. But okay. I, I absolutely myself do want to revisit it as well. If uh, and whatever those things that happen to turn us in a new direction, uh, I'd like to hear it when it happens. Agreed. I think it's important. Your language could be something to the effect of the policy will be reviewed, whether you say monthly, um, and subject to change based on various factors, being that we, we know that two of the factors that were already listed, we're talking about vaccination rates versus our COVID cases, so that it would be reviewed and subject to change based on various factors, if that works. But not. I mean, it says it says that the policy will remain in place until rescinded or modified by the school committee. Michelle, sure. I I would just say the first line here is talking about the Foxborough um, Public Schools, com, you know, the commitment, as well as you know, recognizing the school committee's commitment. And so I think putting language in about that the school committee as well as the Foxborough Public Schools is committed to reviewing this policy on a monthly basis, um, a minimum of a monthly basis, because we might do it more than that. We might put it as something that's reviewed at every meeting, and we meet twice a month. 
typically um, because that we ha already have language in this policy about our commitments. And I think that that is helpful to have that in there, um, not as only a, as a reminder, but also um, as part of overall the policy. Um, so that, that would be my thought to have it in. I agree with that. Okay. I think that sounds. Maybe, Mr. Chairman, also, I, I, and Michelle, maybe I, I'm curious, maybe any words. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what review means, reviewing a policy. Does that mean we read it, or do we just review metrics or listen to help Board of Health data? Because is, isn't that what it is? I mean, I agree with you. I, I agree with reviewing, but isn't reviewing reviewing information? I, I don't so think maybe, just reading the policy monthly makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. Sure. I don't think we need to read sure. the policy, but I think what she's getting at is that we sure. have an update on yeah. where we're at. We have a, a mask. We put in the policy that we make a commitment as school committee and as a board to revisit the situation and sort of take a temperature check on where we're at at least once a month that we put it, you know, pin in the agenda. I, I, forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I, I think that's kind of what I'm hearing you say, Michelle. I, I, yeah, I'm I, not saying that we have to re read it at every meeting, um, but if we determine that, you know, it's on the agenda and if it's something that we need to change language from mandated to recommended or rescind it, um, that it's something that we can do in a dynamic way, that there isn't a real lag of, you know, a month, two months until something can happen. And I recognize that we have language in here that the superintendent um, can also utilize her discretion um, with, uh, you know, hopefully with the school committee's guidance. Um, and, but I think that given that this is such an important issue and it's an important issue to the community at large as well as um, the teachers and the school department um, i think we need to make it a priority and putting language in there saying that we're going to commit to re um, addressing the issue rather than review addressing the issue on a monthly basis um, i think will help it's not a cure-all but at least it it, it helps I understand what you're saying. I'm going back to, I think, Richard's, or I know I'm going back to Richard's comment, sorry, which is, do we, for policy, do we need to, is it appropriate to build in that kind of language into a policy? If we add it as a recurring meeting item on our agenda, and this is the, and we expect to, and we expect to discuss and review, is the policy still appropriate? Is that enough? Or do we, it, I, again, I just, I think I'm questioning now, I understand what we're trying to accomplish and I agree we need to continue to revisit this on a very frequent basis, but is it appropriate to put that kind of language in a policy? Brent. Generally, no. However, <laughs> okay, yeah, and so it, yeah, I'm, whatever, I'm a policy geek, but like, I, generally, no, you don't do that, uh, however, there are certain times, exigent circumstances, and things that people care about where you, you, you may uh, depart from that general maxim to, to, to basically publicly commit as a board to the public to say, yeah, we're going to do this. And in that case, I'm, I'm fine with it. Being fine, can putting in the timeline. Ordinarily, I wouldn't, and you know, can in I? fact, actually, people people on this particular school committee, uh, this particular makeup of the school committee, have been very good about taking a lot of those things out because they're they're generally not helpful. Um, but hey, if we find it helpful, I'm all for it. I, I, I would offer that we request that the superintendent report back to us in the first meeting of every month, uh, and, and we give it a title, or give it a title, something like the the face mask policy update and we request that the first meeting of every month the superintendent reports to us as a school committee and that will include conversations with the board of health as well 
So just to clarify, you're talking about adding an agenda item, but not adding it to the policy, That's correct? what I would say, yeah. Again, I, I'm kind of with Brent. The policy is the policy. We have total control of the policy at any given moment we want. But if we would like a hard placeholder, which I think we should for the public as well, knowing that the first meeting of every month, you know, this is our target, the first meeting of every month. So We're just saying it's got to be somewhere. Yeah. Like, so I'm, I, I'm per, like, unlike other policies, I'm fine putting it in the policy. So uh, I am. In this case, and so I'll go with you know. I know that. it's your policy, um, so I feel kind of odd saying something, but um, we <laughs> usually have uh, weekly updates on COVID and the health Fine. status of the town. Uh, we attend weekly meetings with all of DPH, all the other towns, um, and um, sometimes Desi comes and the CTC, um, and so we just talk about it at all of our town meetings. Um, so. If that was something that you guys wanted to include, that might be a good opinion, a good option. Um, but it may not, like a, like we've been talking about, it may not have to be in the actual policy. But we talk about it, we talk about COVID, and that's kind of how these recommendations from our board to the town came about because we have been following it every single meeting, um, and we came up as a board and say, hey, we've been following COVID, we've been following the Delta variant, Tom's recommendations, his emails. And we decided to make um, a public statement. Um, and so that's something that could be done as well. Okay. Michelle? Thank you so much for that. And um, I, it just sort of sparked in me is there any way for the school committee members to get kind of updated information almost automatically regarding what? is happening in the town and the recommendations from the health board. Is that something, is there a mechanic mechanism in place to help with that? I, I think somebody's nodding. I'm just not sure who's gonna respond <laughs> yeah, to that. Yeah. I'm understanding that the, the board of health could send it to me and yeah. then I could disseminate that information. And you're talking about whenever you wanna disseminate it, you know, you can always get that, you know, whatever you need. Yeah, we, we can, we can all, uh, Obviously, we can do something internally where, you know, once a month I can give something to the superintendent uh, regarding, you know, where we are um, as a town um, in terms of COVID. That would be fine. Okay, so where do we stand on this language? I, I, I don't, I, I, I know, Richard, you have a position. Frank, you are, you have a position. Michelle, where are you standing now based on the discussion? I still would feel more comfortable just adding something to that last line of the first paragraph where it says, you know, the following requirements which remain in place until further notice, you know, something along the lines, you know, with frequent or monthly um, reviews by the school committee. Okay. My question on that then becomes when at some point in the future, when we are out of this current situation, are we still considering, we then have to go back and revise the policy to remove that language? Which is not, I mean, it's, it, it happens, it's a normal part of what we do, which is reviewing policy and making revisions. We just have to make sure that that is something that potentially future school committees um, are aware of and do. Well, I would assume that at that point the the whole policy would be rescinded. If we're not having a requirement for face masks, then we would be rescinding the policy. Okay. okay. Sarah, where do you, where you, where you, how are you I'm feeling about the language? I'm in agreement with Michelle. I am in agreement with her. Okay. So what would that what would you recommend, Michelle? That sentence, since you are on the you and Sarah are on the policy subcommittee, <laughs> um, what would you recommend that sentence? Or that statement, where would it be added and what would it say? Give me a minute. Sorry. Okay. That's fair enough. Because my understanding is if we're gonna make a revision like this, we need to have it apart tonight because it needs yep. to we need to make it available because it will be included in the vote for next week. So we need to make that decision tonight if we're gonna make the edit. Could I make a quick suggestion? Like uh follow the most recent DESI guidance or something along that lines. Um, or, D yeah, DES it would be DESI guidance for okay. face masking. Sarah? All right. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. If I can just have a second to speak to to everything that's happened tonight. I have a lot of notes. I've, um, I just need to let everyone know I am in support for myself, you know, of mask wearing and for my family because, you know, I want to keep them safe. We have babies at the house, et cetera, et cetera. But I have heard a lot of language here, and you just brought up DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed. And as I read this, I hear recommend suggest recommendations everything is a guidance there are no mandates from the governor from department of elementary or secondary ed everything has been lifted from them they're giving us guidance and suggestions and it's it's wonderful i think it will help keep people safe i think that's really important but i don't think because we're making a policy I don't think pulling in, and in all due respect, I think pulling in the information is important, putting the language that following guidance or following suggestions from anyone, they're not making these policies and we're not doing this. It wasn't like last year where we did it because there was a state of emergency or because Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed said you had to close the buildings. We're not doing it because of any other party. This is a Foxborough school committee and a Foxborough school decision. So I think the guidance is very important. It's very important to follow the science, to follow what's going on, but I think it's important that we take ownership of the policy here in Foxborough because they're putting it on town to town, which I think my opinion is that it's very unfair because COVID doesn't stay within the, the, the confines of the Foxborough town lines. And to what Rob said, we are responsible for staff, we're responsible for students, we're responsible for people that we could transmit outside of the schools. Staff doesn't all live in Foxborough, you know what I mean? People work outside of Foxborough. Kids go on travel teams, on buses, to towns outside of Foxborough. Spectators are, are mixing with each other outside of Foxborough. So I think it's really important that we gear this to Foxborough with the guidance of very important, very important, you know, medical um, and state agencies. That's my two cents. Thank you. Um, based on that, are there recommend recommendations to changes in the language that you're that you're looking for? Or no, I just I, I don't think we should reference any of our choices to any of any one other agency. I think our choices okay. should be specific to Foxborough when we write the policy. Okay because we're not being guided by anyone but our own school committee, our educators, you know, and, and our families here in Foxborough. Okay, so I just want to be clear. So the way the policy is written out, because there are references to- There the are references. Are you asking us to now remove those references? No, not okay. the references, but I don't think there should be specific language guiding the policy based on anyone else besides our school committee, our superintendent, and our Foxborough influences. Okay. Thank you. Michelle. Um, so I, here's a suggestion and, and I would, you know, ask Dr. Burtis for input on, on the language as well. Um, I was thinking adding to the first paragraph uh, um, an additional sentence that says, you know, the Foxborough School Committee commits to monthly monitoring of this policy based on the then current conditions. Um, so something along those lines. Foxborough School Committee commits to monthly monitoring of this policy, and I missed the last part, sorry. Based on then current conditions. So based on the current conditions. Questions, comments on that particular statement? I think it sounds good. Dr. Bertos, is that? I, I, think, I think that would um, cover what you're trying to get to. We, we've got that review of it, and it's showing the commitment at the same time. Thank you. So is everyone on the committee good with including that as for the second reading of the policy? 
is that language? And Janet, did you capture that? I wrote it down if you didn't. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michelle, for the addition of the language. Are there any other questions or about the policy, questions about our, our language that you think we need to revise on the, on the current policy? The, the only other thing that I'd like to bring up, and in, in Dr. Berto said um, this at the very beginning, she, she talked about how we have to get people back in school, and the metrics that we have are sort of based on last year's seniors and sort of last year, you know, some of the vaccination numbers, we were at 49%, but you were saying some of them are students that are off already in college. So let's get back in the building and revisit it and see where we're at. I really liked that you made that statement. I think that's something that we should definitely build on, you know, once we get people back in school to look at where the vaccination rates are in the high school, look at where it is with the staff. You know, I believe it's, it's, uh, it's unfair, but Ahern is unfortunately the sacrificial lamb because the guidance is saying up to sixth grade and you've got a building with five through eight, but we do have, you know, the high school and we definitely have some data that we can chase. So I think, I, I like that you said that and I think it's important mm -hmm. to make a commitment to revisit that specifically. I just wanted to say that, thank you. And that information is really important for us to know with vaccination status too, because if we do have a close contact, then if someone is vaccinated, they're exempt from any further testing. They don't have to quarantine, they can stay in school. If they have a mask on, based on the protocols, they're exempt. We are going to be engaging. We um, have applied as part of the testing program with DESE to be able to do the uh, stay, the test and stay, which is if we had a close contact and someone then needed to have testing because they were <coughs> vaccinated, well, they weren't exempt, they didn't have a mask on for some reason, we would be able to do that with the parent's consent, of course, and then that would be done for five days in a row, and as long as it's negative, they can stay in school. And again, awesome. that's the goal. We don't want yeah. students having, we had, we had students that had to quarantine, they never, we didn't have the transmission, they weren't positive, but they had to quarantine and be out of school. By us having these mitigation factors in place, it makes more students exempt if they were a close contact, and then at the same time having this additional mitigation strategy of being able to do the test and stay. If we had someone who was not exempt from that, then if they're negative, we can continue to do that five days in a row and have them stay in school. The same thing is said for if someone's symptomatic and we had a question, not to test all symptomatic, it's not that piece, but if we had that question mark, sure. we could then engage in that. And that information would be going out to parents as well. Thank you for sharing that. I wasn't aware of any of that, so that's all really important information. I, I think that's all showing everything that's, this has only been in the last several days. Sure. And two questions on that. Um, go ahead, Michelle, I'm sorry. I was just gonna ask what needs to happen for us to get a better idea of what the vaccination rate is like in the high school. Do um, parents have to turn in their, you know, physicals? I know 10th grade has physicals and stuff like that. Like what needs to occur to better understand um, that rate? One of the things that we can do through our SNAP program, which is linked, and Tom, you can help me out here with the MAVA, any vaccinations that take place, it gets connected with our data and we can run reports to see by grade level. And Jen Rosenberg, who's our nurse leader, is starting to run. She's run that data for what we have so far, but there's a lag time between the database and what that comes forward. So aside from having to go and ask every single parent if their child is vaccinated and have proof of vaccination, we're getting that data that way. So we'll find out how accurate it is with those numbers. And again, they've committed at the state level to saying that they they update that on Thursdays. That's my understanding. This is a maybe a Board of Health question. It may be a you question. Are we allowed at the schools to ask for a proof of vaccination? We, we can ask for vaccination okay. um, because that's going to make a difference of whether they're exempt and being able to stay in school. There are parameters, confidentiality, we, can't, we have to have certain things in place to where it's any reporting out that we did, we could never have any of that information is specific, just strictly numbers. Okay. Tom, anything else to add there as far as looking at those rates that 
No, it's just messed. important to understand that there is a lag time from the data being input to it being received locally. Usually it's about, you know, anywhere, anywhere to a few days to a week, and a lot of the numbers coming back can be up towards to a week to two weeks. So there is a, there is a slight delay. And it depends on how responsive, you know, providers are or, or, you know, health clinics, that type of thing. The other piece that will go out at the beginning of the year once students are back in school is that consent from, and it's a, where we've applied and been accepted into the program for testing, where parents have to give consent in order to have their child tested in school. We can't do that without parental sure. consent. That form will be a little bit confusing because it has to list the three different options, which are pooled testing, test and stay, or, um, symptom or asymptomatic testing. We're looking to test and stay. We can always add on others, but what is going to be based on our context, it would be the test and stay. So it's going to be important for parents to complete that paperwork so that we would be able to do that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, too. That would be great. Two other, I just had two things. Um, just, Dr. Burris, could you remind everyone about the um, forum? Yes. Um, just so I know you sent the email out, but, and it's available on the website, but could you just remind everyone about the forum? So tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, we'll be having a virtual town hall meeting, thanks to Foxborough Cable Access and facilitating that for us. That allows us to have the large numbers. Our panelists that will be on, um, that will be all of our administrators. Uh, Deputy Chief Tom Kinnan will be on there. Our nurse leader, Jen Rosenberg, will be on there as well. And that's just going to be presenting what schools will look like, also provide additional information of why we've recommended for masks in schools. But importantly, because we know so many parents are looking to have normalcy, the best that we can. We're not in rows anymore with children facing forward. We're able to put them into groups, elementary classrooms, back to having carpets in our classroom with them sitting together and teaching and learning pedagogy and practices of what is best practice and what is normal for our students. The social distancing has been lifted. Mask outdoors on school grounds in athletics outdoors lifted. It's really the difference is continuing to emphasize hand washing, continuing to use our, our wipes and all of our cleaning, continuing with our custodians, doing the electrostatic misters every day um, and cleaning our buildings, having um, masks on school buses, that is a federal requirement. And then at the same time, our ventilation systems, we increased that, we had the full study done, our filters are done quarterly, um, those are replaced. All of those other mitigation, it's, uh, Jen Rosenberg talks about it as Swiss cheese. As we, continue, awesome. as we continue to layer She's that. Awesome. So we want parents to understand that classrooms are gonna look different from last year. What we're holding on to from last year is the mask in the classroom. Thank you for that reminder. My last question, um, and maybe this might be the last one on the policy is, has the teachers association where where have they reviewed the policy as it is now and what is their feeling about masks in the classroom yes we've provided this to our foxborough education association and they are very much of the mindset of what the local board of health is suggesting that we have had this partnership and worked closely and not to go against what the local board of health is um, recommending here and at the same time they they want to get back to teaching as they know it and if we can get rid of the desk in the cafeteria and having students facing one direction and to have them working in groups as what it looks like in a regular year, if they're vaccinated, do they want to wear masks? None of us do. We want to get back to normal, but it's a small price to pay if we can have all of the other pieces. And most importantly, we want and they want our students in school and not quarantining because that's, that's a lot of extra um, it's, it's work for the students, for the families, for the teachers, if you're not able to be in school. Thank you. Before I close out this agenda item, are there any other questions or comments? Michelle? I, we can't hear you. Do we need to vote on that added language? I don't think so. I think so I because it's the, the first reading. reading. We would have to, right. right. Just confirming. Thank you. So Thank you. again, 
I want to close out the discussion on the policy. Are there any other questions or comments or requested revisions to the text as it's written? No? Thank you guys. I really appreciate the discussion. I appreciate all the information and the participation um, and the respect that I think we all showed or hope that you all felt that we showed toward each other and our different uh, opinions and perspectives. So thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move to the open public comment um, portion of our agenda this evening. Um, before we do that, um, the first thing I will do is remind everyone um, of what are uh, some of the policies that we have for open public comment. Um, first, uh, we have five people that have identified that they would like to speak. One person, Joe, already spoke this evening. So we'll skip Joe because he had to leave. But is there anyone else who would like to participate in the open public section and you have that signed up? I would, we, again, we, because we do want that to be a part of the public record, we want to make sure we capture the information correctly. I would ask that you sign up um, on this sheet. Um, when you do, when, when we call your name, I'll ask you to come forward, state your name and address at the, at the microphone here. Um, and then you will have up to five minutes um, to share whatever your comment is. After five minutes, it is my discretion as to whether I let you continue, as to whether we let you continue with your comment, or whether at that time we'll thank you and we will call the next person forward. Okay. Um, and before we, yes, I'm gonna, and, the, and the first thing we will do once we get all the signatures on the list is um, acknowledge all the receipts that came into the community inbox, which has been our normal policies. Um, so, uh, as always, if you want to send in submissions to the school committee inbox. We do also read who has made submissions um, so that those are also a part of the public record. Did you want to list who those were? Yep, I'm gonna do that one second as soon as we. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the submissions to the community inbox that came in, and this is as of about 2.45 this afternoon. So all the submissions that came in from our last meeting up until about 2.45 p.m. this afternoon, any submissions that came in after that, we will provide that information at the meeting on the 24th. So, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. A Kate Lavier, uh, Lavieri, um, 37 Granite Street. Uh, Lisa Pereira, 15 County Street. Susie Light, 261 East Street. Matt Light, 261 East Street. Shelby Cornbluth, 20 Lawton Lane. Again, Lisa Pereira with a second submission, 15 County Street. Shoshana Hutchinson, Hutchinson, excuse me, 79 Moore Street. Pam Glidwell, 16 County Street. Melissa Davey, uh, Summer Street. Uh, Leanne Young, 2 Meadowview Road. Terry McPhee, 10 Church Street, and Gene O'Brien, 3 Night Lane. So thank you for sending that in. Um, the entire committee has received a copy of your submission, and we'll certainly be reviewing those and taking um, your comments and, and um, submissions into account as we review any of the policies. Uh, now, there are five people listed as part of wanting to participate. Um, under the MASC guidance, what I would like to do is if anyone wants to make a comment or share an opinion that is not related to the mask policy, I would like those people to come forward first so that we can keep all the comments and opinion on the mask policy together. Um, that's just one of the guidances that MASC recommends. So is there anyone that's here present this evening that wants to comment on something other than the mask policy? Yes, sir, would you like to come forward, please? Uh, my name's Joe Frizzoni, and uh, I have a daughter, Angelina, that goes to Foxborough High School. I, I was against, she wanted to do homeschooling before the pandemic. I was totally against it. Last year, she did homeschooling, and uh, she did pretty well at it. Uh, she suffers from anxiety at times, and mask, no mask, She's very conscious of COVID. Uh, we've lost some family. And I spoke to Dr. Baderas uh, here a couple of days ago, uh, maybe last week. I'm asking if you can let her graduate with the Foxborough class, yet do the homeschooling. They're saying she has to unenroll uh, the school committee. I've been 
in Foxborough had at least one home since 1984. This is all she wants. And I ask you guys, could you please do that? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the normal policy is that we, for things that um, are not a part of the normal agenda, we actually will take those things under guidance and then um, come back with any questions or um, action based on your comment this evening. Okay. So, you, you, so you want me to say No, 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 no. We would come back at a different time, not oh, as part fine. of this meeting. That's fine. I just had to ask. Okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us this evening. Anyone else that has a non-face mask related comment that they'd like to make? <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. So first on the list, um, and again, I apologize, uh, Berta Serafin, please cut forward and uh, sit, uh, state your name and address, please. I apologize for being so formal. I really do. It, it's, I, I'm Berta Serafin, 4 Walnut Street, Foxborough. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to make a comment on the mask policy? No, I'm good. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. <laughs> my uh, English is not my first language. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we're not worried about the five minute limit now yet either, so we're doing really well. Uh, next on the list, uh, thank you, is Julie Curry. That's funny. Hello. Hi there. Do I have to send my address and stuff? Yes, please. Oh, and I'm sorry, there is one other piece of the policy. If you do have written comment with you, we do need to get a copy of that written comment because it does need to be included as part of the meeting minutes. So oh. after you read that, we would, if you can share that with, with Janet, it will be, we'll be able to put it in as part of the meeting. I forgot to remind everyone of that. Okay. Sorry. All right. Julie Curry, 55 Cross Street. And I'm here tonight to oppose the mask mandate for the upcoming school year. A year and a half ago, we were all very nervous about the unknowns of this virus, but as time has passed, it seems that a lot of these mandates are not only unnecessary, but harmful. And I understand that some children are fine with masks, but they haven't really had much of a choice, and they've been conditioned to believe that they have to wear them. <coughs> Scared to even take them off for fear of getting sick. It's sad, and it's socially, emotionally, and psychologically damaging, and these kids have suffered enough. And I think it's time to have some normalcy in their lives. And I appreciate you saying that things are getting back to normal with the rugs and the groups and how lunch will look. But I feel like removing masks is just one more thing that will allow them to see each other's facial expressions and smiles. I was a teacher myself before I had children. And I know facial expressions is a huge part of how kids learn and develop, and especially at a young age. I think it's very important for them to see facial expressions, and they're unable to do that. And JAMA Pediatrics, a journal published by the American Medi Medical Association, found that wearing face masks increases the amount of carbon dioxide inhaled in, the, in the, their air to unhealthy levels. After only three minutes of wearing a mask, carbon dioxide levels were six times higher than the unsafe threshold. And I have that print out as well, if you would like me to turn that in. Um, this virus has a 99.99% survival rate for people under the age of 40. Healthy kids are not dying from COVID. From everything that I have heard and read, the people that are dying, which is obviously a tr very much a tragedy, it's people with underlying comorbidities, other health conditions. It's not healthy people or healthy children, not saying that there's any, that they're any less than anybody else, but it's the, t the typical child is not affected. And I know the five-year-old mentioned who had COVID recently, and he was asymptomatic. Um, I believe it should be a choice whether or not we ha kids have to wear masks on their face. Um, so a recommendation, I'd be fine with a recommendation, but I don't think it should be a requirement. The curve has been relatively flat since November. I also have another Johns Hopkins graph that shows since from September 2020 to July 2021, it's been basically 
straight across. I can leave that here too. Many other local towns are not requiring masks, and I strongly urge you to vo vote to give us a choice. Masks, especially in the heat, breed harmful bacteria that is going directly into the, young, the lungs of the children, and there has been no proof that this Delta variant is stronger than the original virus. And if you look historically at viruses, when they mutate, they become weaker. So if we follow science, each strain and each mutation should be weaker than the previous strain. Fauci has said himself that masks are ineffective as virus particles are so small. I know that was earlier on in the pandemic, but nothing has changed with face masks. So wearing a mask to stop a virus is as useless as using a chain link fence to stop mosquitoes. Baker has also not mandated masks again, so I don't understand why the schools would. Masks are intended for sick people and not healthy people, so I don't see why healthy children should be covering their air supply when they're trying to learn because it makes it very hard to focus. Um, two weeks to flatten the curve has turned into a year and a half with no end in sight, so I appreciate Michelle's amendment, at least trying to get the ducks in a row for what's, what's next, because there really is no end in sight. And if you think wearing a mask for the next three months, six months, or nine months is going to stop the spread, I just don't believe that's going to happen, because there's always going to be a new variant. There's going to be new cases. This virus isn't going to go away. We just need to find ways to, to live with it. And the sooner everyone ca has some type of immunity, then things might return to normal. And in closing, I think family should always come before the government. The government does not know better than the parents, and you are taking responsibilities that should be ours as parents to know what is best for our children. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And like I said, if you just make sure Janet has a copy of our Thank you, Julie. Next on our list is Scott Bissonette. How are you doing? My name is Scott Bissonette. I live here at One Walnut Street. Thank you, everybody, for giving me a time. I do not have anything prepped with me inside the box to uh, illustrate a point that I may have. I'm not going to take anything away from what she just said because I fully support everything she just uh, pointed out. And there's no need for me to completely re uh, and repeat what she just said. So therefore, kind of disappointed without uh, a policy was already made before we even got a vote here tonight. Uh, so it was almost like, is there even a point of us coming to discuss this if the policy is going to be made without the opinions of the parents? Um, so that's a little disappointing. Also, I'd like to know if the child goes to school. So if I send my kid to school without a mask, are you really going to throw him out of school on a day-to-day -day basis? Even DSE said there would be no uh, punishment or anything for them. There is no policy saying that they will be thrown out of school or anything. And also, so we have these masks here that should be completely approved by. We can take some out and you guys can all look at them. The old Board of Health is even wearing the same ones. But in a big warning right here that says, these masks help protect against certain particular contaminants, but do not eliminate exposure to the risk of any disease or infection. So it's a false reality that we're all living in here, that this is going to protect me from the biggest virus, deadliest virus known to man right now. If these are also required on the children's and because this virus is so deadly, does the school have a plan for a biological disposal plan? Because if this is contaminated every day, the child breathes into it, it must be covered in COVID at some point. So do they just get thrown away in the regular trash, or should they properly be disposed of in some kind of biological uh, hazmat material container? So I'm just going to end that there. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank you for your comment. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next is Shelby Cornbluth. Shelby Cornbluth, 20 Lawton Lane. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the previous speakers. So I, um, I sent a pretty lengthy public comment for everyone to read. I had um, 
documentation to support that comment. There were a couple of papers that I included that could have been considered opinion, but they referenced actual studies, and they just said things much more eloquently than I could ever say them because I don't, I'm not the best writer in the world. Um, so I just wanted to concentrate on a couple of things. The first thing is um, vaccination rates. So I think, Dr. Berdos, you mentioned earlier that the vaccination rates for 12 to 15-year-olds in Foxborough was 49%, and 16 to 19-year-olds was 70%. Um, according to mass.gov today, those rates were 63 and 77% respectively. So I think that generally speaking, our vaccination rates in the town are higher. I understand your point about the 16 to 19 year olds, but the vast majority of high school seniors are 18. So, um, or will be turning 18 um, this coming year. So I think that um, even if those numbers are closer to say 63%, um, you can ask what, when, when you get herd immunity. A lot of people originally said that herd immunity was at that 60 to 65% rate. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is that the reality is, is masks don't work. Like everyone says that they work, but if you look at the data, um, they don't. The CDC is using observational studies to support mask wearing. These observational studies are not controlled. It's by looking at like certain environmental situations and conditions and saying, oh, gee, the person who had a mask you know, infected less people than the person who didn't. And in, in it's, ret it's retrospective. So, and there was no control group against that. And they say, because of this, mass may work or mass should work. But when you actually look at the studies, the randomized controlled trials that are the gold standard of all medical um, applications, um, those studies, said that there was no significant difference between mask wearing and unmask un -mask wearing for the prevention of disease. And so I think that it's really irresponsible of us to require our children to wear masks when somebody said they could work or that when studies show that there's no significant difference when you look at the data. Um, the, the, uh, uh, Moving on to a different point, um, or actually one last follow-up on that. One of those studies actually demonstrated that because people don't wear masks properly, kids are constantly touching the mask, touching other things. It actually had a worse impact on disease transmission than not wearing a mask at all. Because if you're touching all sorts of stuff and you're touching your mask, it's much easier to spread. How many people have gone to the supermarket, touched their mask, and picked up produce? Everybody does it, right? It's, it, or very few people don't do it. All, the people who don't do it are like trained doctors. So I think it's very important to realize that as well. Um, I did want to go back to the mass.gov data. If you look at the mass.gov data, we all understand that the Delta variant is there. We have seen an uptick in that. But if you look at the data trends that I looked at um, earlier this evening, and I have the charts on my computer if you want to see it, you see the trend starting to come down. The, the curve is it's already curved. And so Typically, hospitalizations and um, deaths lag that by two weeks. So if you already see those cases already starting to come down, everything else is starting to come down too. So this Delta variant is, um, is, could most likely be on its way down. So to say that we need masks to protect against the Delta variant is, it, it, I mean, I think we need more data on that to say that. Um, a last study that um, I looked at was um, Florida last year had 40 counties that did not wear masks, excuse me, 40 counties that wore masks and 27 counties that did not wear masks. And there was no difference in the rate of COVID amongst students in, in those counties. That's a lot of data. I mean, we should all be looking at that type of data, not like, oh, well, somebody wore a mask once and they didn't transmit the disease as much, and which is the studies that the CDC is recommending. So I think that we, those, that's the type of data we really need to look at to make sure that we're doing what's right for our kids. Um, and then if you really want to help them, put engineering controls in place. All of the filters and the air exchange, that is what works. That's what makes it work. There's a, there are studies published by um, industry trade groups that demonstrate that when you test masks for aerosol transmission, they're 10% effective. And if you have proper airflow and air transmission and proper filters, you can be 90% effective. So how do you know that the, that the things that you've already implemented in the school aren't good enough? Like, how do you know? Have you done any testing to see the difference in the air quality? quality and to see if you're transmitting, maybe that's where we should really be concentrating instead of mass to pretend that we're going to be solving a problem. Um, so that's really you know, what I had to say about that. I did have a couple questions um, in addition to that. 
Last year, we had a policy that if your child was in close contact, that everyone had to be quarantined and tested. Do we know how many of those kids that were quarantined and tested because they were in close contact were actually COVID positive? Do we have a number? This is just public comment as far as getting into answers. Right. So I just. I w I'm looking to you as chair as far as right um, so what we would what we would prefer to do Shelby is actually if you have questions we're happy to take the questions yep and that's we can fine provide answers at, the, at, at, a, at a different time but we wouldn't provide answers this I would have loved to ask that question earlier but I just thought of it while I was sitting here so okay. and then the other question I actually have and this I think somebody else brought up is that we're having a you're having a virtual town hall tomorrow night. In that virtual town hall, you're going to be talking about what everything's going to look like. And so quite honestly, like I agree with the previous gentleman. It sounds like like this is a done deal. Like you've already made up your mind. We've had no chance to say anything. So what's the point of all this? Like are you really even care about what we think? I mean, I mean I know the school committee members are all volunteers and we really appreciate your time, but the staff of the school works for us. Like we we pay your salaries like the, our taxes pay you so you work for us so shouldn't you be concerned with what we think that and you know that's all I had to say thank you thank you um, is there anyone else who did not get a chance to put their name down okay come on up please and I would just ask you if you don't mind again just so we have it as part of the record thank you You don't have to do a phone number you don't want. Thanks very much. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of time that we've been here, I've noticed, I was wondering why you guys would take your masks off to talk. We take our, we tend to take our mask off to talk. Again, this is, our protocol is not typically to respond to direct questions during the public comment, but we take our mask off to talk because we want them recorded because we know that the mask, uh, we are maintaining social distancing, and we know that the mask and the microphones actually comes through clear for people that are watching at home. But, but how, do you, maintain how do you think people with hearing impaired or like kids that are trying to learn to understand kids that have, you know, hearing issues? Um, my son has apraxia. He needs to see people's mouths to learn where, to, where the words in his mouth talk, but he's not allowed to take his mask off like that. But I've noticed through the whole meeting, all of your masks were coming down just to talk. But kids can't do that. And you know, there's kids with disabilities, and it's not fair to them. They can't see the teacher's mouth. They, especially kids that can't get their words out, and they're trying. The teachers have to see what they're trying to say. Well, the teachers don't know what they're trying to say because their mouths are covered. Would you like to? You can choose not to respond. You can choose to respond to that. I will just say there's different strategies. Many times we we know that it's important to be able to see mouth formation. Students that are learning even to read and to see how they're pronouncing um, sounds. And so to be able, social distancing, to be able to say, how, how are you making that sound? If it's a, it's digraphs or those kinds of things. Or our speech language pathologists, they have clear masks where you can but see the But the clear facial. ones get very foggy. They don't recommend them because they get very foggy. So nothing's perfect. We're trying different strategies. We've used face but, shields. We've used plexiglass. We've had a number of different. And nothing works. So these kids are getting set back because they can't communicate because they can't take their mask off like you guys are to talk. They take their mask off when they're in mask breaks, when they're outside. Per breaks, but when they're learning stuff. Breaks, I'm sorry. For learning stuff, learning purposes during class when there's a whole class, they can't take the mask off to talk. And the teachers are trying to understand what they're saying. They're trying to understand what the teacher's saying. My son can't, he can't use his words. He's trying, but he can't. With the mask, it's hard. Yeah, they're great. They keep the mask on because they don't know any difference, which is really sad. They don't have a say. But he's struggling to talk, and he can't understand because the mask is covering both mouths. And just like you guys, it's easier to take your mask off to talk because you're being recorded. Well, every day his life, or you know, in school, he can't take his mask off to learn, and that's something more serious rather than you just talking over the computer. Thank you for your comment. Of course. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment this evening? No? Again, thank you all for your participation this evening. We certainly do respect uh, your, your sharing your time with us and your opinions with us. 
um, before we call our school committee, is, excuse me, is there any other business? I know we don't have that on the agenda, but is there any other items? Okay, well, thank you. We're gonna um, be, would you guys- We're adjourn our meeting, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Um, uh, time being 8.30, five, I'm gonna make a motion to adjourn the Board of Health portion of the meeting. I'll second it. Okay. And we're in both in favor? All in favor, all right. right. Okay. All right. Good, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your Thank time. You all. Thank you for joining us. We, uh, and then, out. Michelle. I just wanted to say, you know, thank you to the parents um, that have sent in their submissions and um, that came and spoke. Um, we do hear you and we're listening. I just want you to know that. And thank you. And thank you to the health. Um, committee coming in and talking tonight. We appreciate that. Thank you. With that, may I, if there are no other items um, for discussion, may I have a motion to adjourn our meeting this evening? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Sarah. Second? Second. Oh, Richard, adjourn. thank you. Um, Michelle, how would you vote to adjourn? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Richard, yes. yes. Sarah. Yes. And then oh, I'm a, a yes as well. So we are turning four zero zero. Thank Thanks. you guys very much. Thank you guys for being here. Oh, no.